Advent season's greetings to you as we uh, launch the second edition of a video of On Further Reflection with Norm Allen. I am that aforementioned Norm Allen. I'm going to offer some thoughts about Advent uh, as we have these 24 days in December uh, before Christmas Day. Uh, I am going to be having some questions from a friend of mine who will remain anonymous, which will help the conversation. I was struck the other day, I thought the apocalypse must be on us because when I was going through a Costco magazine, it said that Tim Hortons has an advent calendar and you can get a whole bunch of Keurig pods, uh, one each day for 24 days of various, and I didn't, and I thought, well, that is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, then I saw, you can, if you pay $112,000 US, buy a Tiffany advent calendar and your dream of having a silver plated harmonica as one of the 24 items may cause your dreams to come true. And so it's kind of an odd thing when we think about how much religion is being put outside the public square, that now in the season of advent, we have every commercial enterprise possible, including $112,000 advent calendars from Tiffany's, uh, somehow connecting to this season. Uh, this season, though, uh, throughout history, has actually been a time of sober reflection, and it's almost like Lent. And it's a time when one can take time to do some reflecting about life and God and the darkness of the world around us. That's a, that's a pretty common thing. Like out of the tribe that I was raised in, Advent or the church calendar was not something that we observed. And so in our circle of friends, there would be people who do some sort of Advent celebration, as you say, light a candle a week in an Advent wreath, uh, have Advent calendars for their kids, and they get a nice piece of chocolate every morning before they go to school. Um, but I would say I've been on my own voyage of discovery of Advent, partly as my participation in church, but more as a personal uh, sort of exploration of my own prayer journey. And as I've become more aware of Advent, uh, certainly the, the candle thing with love, peace, joy, and hope uh, being the ingredients, uh, there is also a side to which in my experience this year particularly, accumulating sorrow and facing that with clarity and hope has been part of my Advent experience because this year uh, we've lost friends, uh, dear friends, we've lost friends of friends, we've seen suicides, we've seen all kinds of dark things happening and certainly around the world there are all sorts of dark things happening politically, socially and economically. And so Advent isn't a season where we sort of pretend that Jesus isn't born yet and let's all gin up some excitement and then we'll be surprised on Christmas Day that he arrives. It's actually a process by which we actually engage three directions of vision. We look back at the miracle of the idea that God entered time and history in Jesus. We look around and inward. So we look at ourselves and we look around at the world and we try to see signs of hope, signs of the presence of Jesus. But we also look inward and around, to see the brokenness, see the places in my life that I'm not proud of that need correction and forgiveness, and look around at the places of brokenness where I can be an agent of, of hope and healing, perhaps. And the third piece, before you ask a question, the sec next question is looking forward to the second coming. So Advent means essentially waiting or the arrival of somebody significant. So Jesus arrived at Bethlehem. He arrives in us, in our communities, in our communities of faith, in our relationships, uh, in our private prayer times, in the word and in sacrament. But at the same time, we live believing, and this is where we become, we sort of sound like we're nuttier than a Christmas fruitcake. We believe that Jesus is coming again. And that a lot of the things that have pained us about lack of justice, tragedy, that's the place that reconciliation of the world to God will ultimately be accomplished. And so Advent becomes looking back, looking around, and looking forward. The 
practice is the love, joy, peace, hope candles. In the early church, they had uh, death, sin, judgment, that sort of focus. And so essentially there has been an evolution of what Advent is about. And to a certain extent, Advent has become almost, too, at least for me, has been too sunshiny uh, when in fact, I believe Advent is a, is a time to look with clarity at the pain and the darkness of the world, uh, my own internal need for forgiveness and uh, development. And, uh, and so it becomes kind of taking the rose colored glasses off and taking a clear look at the darkness of the world and recognize that Jesus entered uh, at a time of darkness. A lot doesn't seem to have happened in 2000 years since he came. So we're still hoping for the future that somewhere along the line, what he accomplished in his life, death and resurrection will ultimately come to fruition in his second coming. The interesting things that we do uh, each year is that we provide um, an advent card, a prayer card, which uh, is going to look like this. We're still waiting to get them printed, and they're going to go out by snail mail, and they'll be going out by email at the beginning of uh, the month. And uh, in it, uh, I offer some suggestions for personal uh, prayer practices as we look at Advent. And so, for instance, this year, uh, I have a little introductory piece where I say, what this season is about is watchful waiting. Uh, the 24 days before Christmas Day in many parts of the world are a time of deep reflection and focus on at least three things. And so the looking back, looking around, and looking forward ingredients I put there. And so I suggest we have 24 days from December 1 to 25 before the Christmas Day uh, that we take in some of those days moments of quiet to reflect on uh, our understanding of Jesus. And so within that, I have uh, some prayers and some scriptures for meditating on. Among them, uh, partly to give us focus for the future, is the uh, piece from Revelation where John the Revelator has this amazing vision, uh, which I think gives us hope for the future, where he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, which is what we're working towards and we believe will happen when Jesus returns. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. And then it goes on to talk about the removal of sorrow and death and, and all of the things that we hope for. Uh, I also add in this uh, a reference to Paul's letter to the Romans, where he talks about when we're groaning and the whole of creation groans, we understand the pain of the world. We have pain. And so the Apostle Paul says, and something for us to meditate on perhaps during Advent, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings then cannot be expressed in words. And it goes on to talk about the love of Christ. And, and so there, that's another way for us to connect and say, okay, I'm going to sit just with my groanings and know that God somehow is listening to me. And, um, but I also have a meditative piece in here where um, years ago, uh, one of the most significant meditative experiences I had in the early days of Touchstone, so it's, it's a long time ago, uh, a friend of ours, John McLaughlin, had we were out on a boat on Lake Joseph, and he was going to put us through a silent meditation. There were about eight of us in this boat in the middle of Lake Joe, and he wanted us to sit for a half an hour and just quietly in our minds say the word Maranatha, Lord, come Lord Jesus. And so we sat, guys who were all type A, high drive, bankers, lawyers, judges, it was a, it was a pretty tough group, and we sat in silence, on the lake and drifted and quietly said Maranatha in our minds, come Lord Jesus. And there isn't a guy who was there 25 years ago or 30 years ago, whenever it was, who still doesn't remember that moment. And so the power of being able to just quietly say Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, the idea of Advent 
both in, in the past, in the present, and in the future is part of it. And so I have a, a meditative uh, outline uh, using that, that phrase where we say, into our memory of the year gone by and our hopes and dreams for the next, come Lord Jesus, to forgive, cleanse, and strengthen our lives, Maranatha, to help us love you with our whole heart and mind and soul and strength, come Lord Jesus. And so it goes on with that kind of a, almost like a mantra so that we can sit quietly with it and just sit with Maranatha. But then there may be aspects of, as we look to the future, Jesus, when you come back, that we can, we can somehow just connect to the ongoing story of God's work with humanity and Jesus as he came in Bethlehem, as he continues to come to us uh, in word, sacrament, and relationship, and as, he can, as, he, as we live in hope of his future return. So that's the kind of thing that I'm encouraging people to have access to. I've got other tools on our website uh, that we can, that you can use for meditation, but these happen to be specifically focused on this Advent season. <clears throat> not a big rules guy and um, I've found rules haven't been terribly helpful because first of all what we're talking about is trying to have a relationship and an ongoing conversation with God and so I happen to use quite frequently early mornings to do very specific meditation and journaling and and uh, imagining myself in a story of Jesus life and that sort of thing uh, but I you know this morning for whatever reason, I didn't think it was uh, what I wanted to do. So I'm still in relationship with God, but I didn't have a specific journaled conversation with him. And so I think we have to, uh, first of all, understand that what we're trying to do is, in a sense, create space for that conversation with God. It's like conversations with friends. If we never talk to them, we lose touch. And uh, sometimes we have very intense one-on-ones. Uh, sometimes it's more casual. We're walking down the street. And I think, uh, you know, with all due respect to, to people who are very rigid about their rules, I think the disciplines are helpful. But the first thing to do is say, I don't care about the rules. I care about the relationship with God. And so if uh, once a week helps you in your ongoing conversation the rest of the week to do something very specific, then that's what you should do. If, as it is in my case, partly my job, uh, I should be doing it more often. I'm, that's part of my work. Uh, so I'm kind of like a monk at large, you know? And so if I'm not praying, then I'm really not doing what I'm supposed to do. And I'm sometimes too large as a monk, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other question. But, uh, but I have great prayer times when I'm walking, trying not to be the large monk. Uh, and, you know, I, it's not always necessarily conscious. But as anybody knows, if you go and spend time where you're not occupied by a computer or a screen, and you may be in action, you know, hammering, hammering nails or uh, going for a walk, that it allows the subconscious often to begin to process things. And so it can sometimes turn to prayer. So if you have done, in fact, a little bit of Maranatha type meditating, uh, some morning before you go for a run, uh, that can stay with you for the hour that you're running or whatever you happen to be doing. And so there's a, it's trying to encourage us not to think so much about, oh, I've got to do it every day. And then when you'd fail on day three, you then are embarrassed. So you don't go back and do day four. So you end up doing nothing. So that's sort of a waste of time. And so it's kind of like, okay, if I really believe in God and I really believe that Jesus is coming again, I really believe he's present, then being watchful and being aware of his presence and his action is a pretty sensible thing to do. Jesus tells untold numbers of parables about people who were watchful. And so in one case, he says, uh, there's a group of people who, uh, you know, they were out working in the fields and they come back in and and the master, sort of the Downton Abbey kind of a guy, uh, says, uh, okay, uh, you've done your work, now serve me dinner. And uh, then in another case, he talks about the same kind of Downton Abbey guy and the, the people at his staff at his house are 
watching and waiting for him to return and they run out onto the cobblestone courtway in the in front of the <laughs> castle and they welcome him home and he all of a sudden says here why don't you all sit down i'm going to put on my apron and i'm going to serve you dinner and so you he has these these kinds but in the first parable jesus says don't you know expect a, a big applause for having done your duty you're just useful servants on the other hand, be aware that you serve a God who actually cares enough about you to see that you get nourished. And all we're trying to do is put ourselves in position to be aware and, uh, of God's work in the world and at the same time become nourished in him so that we can, in fact, serve the brokenness of the world. And so this isn't necessarily what I'm, what I'm advocating for is, in a sense, when the church is in its dispersal, when we are in the world doing what the church does, wherever it is, whether it's uh, broadcasting or or farming or banking or lawyering or whatever it is we do, uh, we are conscious of the presence of God in all of those settings. And so doing things that nurture that awareness of God becomes a very important part of the process. It does seem mad uh, when you can get an advent calendar that costs 112,000 US to be trying to do something uh, that reflects the, the Jesus who came in poverty, uh, in anonymity, and in humility and, and great vulnerability. Uh, the God who uh, died on a cross in humili humility and weakness and vulnerability. Uh, but the God who will return uh, one day, as Jesus says, one day it'll be like lightning lights up the sky and uh, something pretty dramatic is going to happen. And so I think that, that in a sense, there's never a perfect time. We all don't get to go to a monastery and be silent. So if, if the world is like at a crazy time of year, this is a perfect time to say, well, you know, it's sort of like, I think maybe for my own health and wellness in the midst of the madness, I'm just gonna step back from this a few times a week for 15 minutes, and I'm gonna say this is something bigger uh, that this is all about. And, and even with the madness, there is some glimmer, as, as corrupted as it's become, there's still some glimmer about the, you know, we got advent calendars. Well, what's the advent? Well, somebody important arrived. Who was that? Oh, that was Jesus. Well, now, you know, I, I find that all ridiculous in a way, but there's still hints of the eternal in some of this madness. And so somehow getting ourselves stepped back for a minute or two, turning off our screens, saying Maranatha for 10 minutes quietly to ourselves, uh, or saying, come Lord Jesus, or saying the Eastern prayer, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, just reminds me that Jesus came, Jesus continues to be present, and Jesus will come again. So there's a, you know, it's like the old mantra that we have in the Anglican Church, Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ will come again. And so there's that, and great is the mystery of faith. And we need to keep staying with that mystery while we're in the madness. At this point in my life, the number one selling point for Advent is that it's a clear way to look at pain. Uh, that when the gospel writer John said uh, that Jesus came into the world, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that light was the life of men, but the darkness did not overcome it. And so with the accumulating sorrows that I have felt this year, and the pain of that. Uh, when I look at the world, there are a lot of reasons to be discouraged. I look at the world, there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful. And so when I look at Advent, it's a place for me to say, I'm not pretending the world's perfect. I am recognizing that the world is broken. And so Advent of Jesus at his birth in Bethlehem, the ongoing Advent of his arrival in and through us in the world to serve the brokenness of the world 
and then spending time in the hope of the advent of Jesus in his second advent, the coming again. And so for me, it's a it's kind of a large uh, way of with realism and honesty dealing with the season of light where uh, it can be so happy clappy that it makes people want to off themselves. And so depression, suicide, and all of that sort of stuff become part of this season where in fact this season is the reverse. It's the hope for those who feel like they have no hope. It's the it's the the grace for those who are powerless. It's the 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 riches for those who have nothing. And yet we're supposed we we impose in our cultural practices a manner of celebrating that makes people feel uh, that they, if they don't live up to the expectations of this fancy picture, that they are losers. And, you know, or they are the, you know, the classic picture of the poor kid on the street looking in at the rich people inside the dining room, uh, all eating and drinking in abundance, and he's out there with no shoes and no food. And so I think that, that this allows us to look at clarity of the needs of the world and our own needs, and then be called, in a sense, to continue to serve the humble Jesus who came to us uh, in his humility and in Bethlehem. And I would just say, as, as a final thing, I've got one uh, very brief uh, piece in our, uh, in our little prayer guide that will be coming out, uh, and it's a lovely poem by a guy named Christopher Fry, where he says these two very brief verses. And with this, I'll finish. The darkest time of the year, the poorest place in town, cold and a taste of fear, man and woman alone, what can we hope for here? More light than we can learn, more wealth than we can treasure, more love than we can earn, more peace that we can measure because one child is born. And may the peace of that child who continues to dwell in us and who will return uh, with power and majesty one day be uh, your peace, hope, love, and joy uh, in this season of Advent.